everyone. Welcome to PyCon SG 2016. It's our, it's, it, factually, it's our seventh PyCon in Singapore, uh, the fourth PyCon SG. Um, before that, we did three PyCon Apex. So this is the seventh PyCon in Singapore. So welcome. <laughs> Let me start off with a few thanks. First, to thank all of you for coming. You know, it's uh, great to see so many Pythonistas gathered in one place. The next, I'm going to thank uh, Dunman High, uh, the students, they're not really in here. But uh, Mr. Guy has uh, had some of his students to come and help volunteer. And we're very grateful and thankful for that. <laughs> thank our sponsors. Platinum sponsors, Garena, Contopian, and Pivotal. Uh, they've set up booths outside. You can actually go and speak to them about their companies. Our gold sponsors, Bitmask, Airbnb. Um, and our silver sponsors, Carousel, Jubilee, The Artling, and Acronis. Lastly, we thank NUS for being our venue sponsor for this lovely venue, and also for the, our communities supporting PyCon, the Python user group, PyData, PyLadies, and the Django Knots, Singapore Django Knots. And I want to thank the uh, Python user group community, um, the, the committee, sorry, uh, Ivan, Li Ming, our president and vice president, and uh, Michael, our finance dude, uh, Morris and Martin, for helping put together this awesome uh, conference. So now let me introduce our keynote speakers. They're awesome guys. Yeah. I've been trolling them for many years. I didn't tell them, <laughs> but now I did. So Daniel and Audrey, are co-authors of uh, the two scoops of Django book. I have two. I didn't tell them as well. <laughs> and uh, core, develop core developers of the cookie cutter project, which I'm using also and I didn't tell them. <laughs> Together they lead a number of open source projects, including Django packages, the website, cookie cutter Django and more. They teach Django at Two Scoops Academy. We're not working. Audrey enjoys watercolor painting, sculpture and photography. And Daniel enjoys reading, writing, flying drones, photography, and capoeira. Whoa. So, they met in uh, PyCon US in 2010. PyCon romance. I don't think it will happen here. Maybe. We'll see. <laughs> and, you know, I'm not going to speak anymore, so I'll let uh, Daniel and Audrey take over. Can you hear me okay in the back? Yeah. Okay. And you want me to try yours? Yeah. Hi, so um, my name is Audrey Roy Greenfeld. And I am Daniel Roy Greenfeld. And our talk today is called How to Write a Popular Python Library by Accident. <laughs> okay, so um, Max. Uh, gave us an introduction, so there isn't really much more to cover here, um, except for that we are open source developers. We do a lot of work in open source. And um, this is a sampling of what we do. We, we spend a lot of time <laughs> in open source. And um, when we do open source work, this is, this is volunteer work. This is work that we do in our free time mostly, just, um, just to contribute back to the Python community. And there's a lot of reasons why we, we do open source. It's not just giving back to the community. Um, for starters, one of the interesting things about 
doing open source and putting it on GitHub or in other places is it does serve as a portfolio. Uh, it means that recruiters or managers can look at your code and not just see what you're doing now, but see how you've progressed from the past when you first started and your code's kind of embarrassing or you look back on it later and it's embarrassing. Well, they can see how you progress and that's really important when you're evaluating a new hire. Open source is great for solving problems, whether you are just, you know, using going on uh, PyPI, finding a library to solve your problem, that's great. But when you um, when you have problems of your own that you that you need to solve and there's no package out there, writing a package and releasing it and have having other people contribute it can be a great way to solve big problems in Python. And there's also the community aspect. You get to meet people uh, in your town, in your state or province, or around the world. I mean, we know Graham because of open source. We know all of you now because of the community of open source. So that's pretty awesome. And finally, the uh, we do open source because we feel like it's a responsibility that we've we've gained so much from from Python and I mean if it weren't for the Python programming language and you know we, we wouldn't have met each other so so we we like to give back. And of course the biggest reason is because it it it's gratifying. It gives us a feeling that we're doing something awesome. Yeah and um yeah uh, <laughs> Um, so, and the thing is, is when you work on open source, when you've been doing it for a while, there are frustrations, there are challenges, there are annoyances, but um, we, we do it because we love it, um, because it, it makes a difference in our lives, and, and yeah, we, we, it's what we do. Yeah, and there's, there's nothing more exciting than if you release a, a library out there and someone, some random person finds it and, and actually uses it and then they, and then next thing you know they find a bug and, and you know, they, they submit a bug report and they give you a patch and, and to receive a, a patch from a random person, it's, it's just the most gratifying feeling in the world. So one of the places that most of our open source code goes on is the Python package index. And this is where you can find, I think it's up to 80,000 open source packages. And you can search and find pretty much anything that you need, almost anything. So I just want uh, to ask a show of hands who here is familiar with the Python package index. Great. That's great. So this, for those of you who don't know, you can go to pypi.python.org. All right, then. Um, who here has actually released a package on the Python package index? Okay, so... A few of you. A few of That's you. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, for those of you who raised your hands, we just want to give you a quick round of applause because... That's awesome. Now that said, everyone in this room, we hope by the end of this sprint or by the end of this conference or, or soon after, we, we'd love to see everybody here release something on the Python package index and let us know. Um, I guess most of you are on Facebook, so yeah, just, just inundate us with, hey, look, I released something. And you're, you're probably wondering, you know, you probably think we're crazy by saying this, but isn't releasing packages hard? And there's a lot of reasons why you might think this. I mean, you, you might just not know how to do it. Or you might think, oh, I'm, I'm not creative enough. I, I could never think of an idea for a useful package. Or you could say, or you, you just haven't been programming long enough to to release a package. I mean, who would use it? You might be thinking, "Oh, I'm I'm not a visionary. You you have to you have to be a special uh, Python god to release a Python package." Well, yeah, that's nonsense. <laughs> stop stop making excuses. <laughs> okay. 
Okay, so there's this big secret about open source packages, and this is one thing that we've learned over the years, and uh, we're, we're going to share it with you. But we don't want you to tell anybody what the secret is, because it's, um, top secret. it's a secret, so don't tell anybody. It's that creators of packages really aren't special visionaries. There's nothing special about the the authors who created packages. You 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 know, they're they're people like they're coders. They're coders like you and me. Yeah, I mean we, you know, those of us who've released packages and and gotten people to use them, or maybe didn't get people to use them, we eat breakfast like you you all have done. Um, when the tea break comes after this, I guess, I don't know what served at a tea break, um, but you know, we're going to drink tea and eat whatever they provide, just like you. So there isn't really that much of a difference. There, there is one difference, and that difference is? They release packages. They just do it. The thing is, is you can take a single function. You know that function that you probably copy from project to project and you use it again and again? Well, that, with a little bit of work, um, with putting the boilerplate around it, can be made into an installable package. And then you're done. You've released that snippet of code that you use again and again as a package. So... Yeah, a, a package really doesn't have to be complicated. It, you know, we really want to emphasize it can be as simple as just picking that that one little reusable snippet of code and putting it into a function. Getting the boilerplate, all the little bits and pieces to make it a package that you can then install on somebody else's machine. Yeah, like your setup.py. And then you, you add that, you combine the two, and that's it. Yep, basically stick your function into the Python package boilerplate and release it as a package. That's, that's it. And that's recipe number one. And recipe number two is the same thing, but instead of just a simple function, it can be a class or a set of classes. It's the same recipe, just, you know, a little bit different. Now we want to mention a a tool that that I wrote that that we are uh, some of the maintainers of, which is Cookie Cutter. It's a command line tool that generates project boilerplate from project templates. For example, if you want to create a Python package project, you can use a project template called Cookie Cutter Pi Package to to generate it. And we'll give a quick demo of it. And okay, one hold. Okay. Con con control it. You want? Okay. Okay. Oops. You wanna? Oh, sorry. Uh, hold on. <laughs> We're trying to get the terminal. Oh shoot. Uh, how do we? Can can someone help okay, us? Let me, let me try. Oh yeah, here we go. But we gotta change. Okay, it's okay. Here, you wanna let me help you? Okay, I can steer from you. Okay, so I'm gonna blow this up a bit. Okay. Yeah. What's up? Yeah, close your other tabs. I can't say. All right, so um, I'm going to go into a directory. Okay, and then. Okay, so I'm going to create a package called foo. And all this does is it's once you install it, if you call foo, it'll return foo as a string. Um, and to make this work, we just call the cookie cutter command. And if I were, um, if I had a working internet connection, I could do this. Oops. 
and, and that would work. It would actually go out to GitHub and get a template and make that work. However, we don't have a working internet connection. So, fortunately for me, we have it locally. Uh, so we're going to call it, and Audrey set some defaults already. Um, yeah, it, so cookie cutter pi package here, this is, this is just the, the repo for the cookie cutter pi package uh, temp project template for creating a Python package. Okay. And you can see her email at MIT. Um, she graduated from there. Uh, and her GitHub username, which is Audrey R. And the project name, we're going to put in foo. And you can see that with the, the next question where it asks project slug, it's lowercase that for us. And uh, I think... We'll give a description. Okay. Actually, I think this window is a little bit too big. Um, returns foo. Okay. And then uh, we're going to put in her PyPI username. She's Audrey R there. Um, and again, it has intelligent defaults and the version. And uh, who here knows what PyTest is? Okay, so we'll just do PyTest. And um, we'll do, we won't do PyPI deployment with Travis. We don't really trust it. <laughs> and um, we won't use Click to provide us with a command line interface. And we do want to have authors listed, so this way if other people make contributions to the project, we can add them, because it's always good to provide attribution. And license, we'll choose MIT, because she went to MIT. And there we go. We actually have a working project now. Um, you can see, well, it's hard to see there, but you can see right there at the bottom, there is, okay? And if I open that up and so, add them? So that foo directory is our newly generated Python package that we have just created by filling in all of those prompts. And once you have it generated, you can go ahead and open it in a text editor, and you can modify the code. You can, you can just stick your function in here, for example. And I don't know what, it will, what our function will do. <laughs> there we go. So it's, it's really simple, but this is something where if we did have an internet connection and if we wanted to um, annoy the people who maintain the Python package index, we could go to here and type python setup.py register. So we'd register the package and then and then this would upload it. So it's register and upload it. And that's it. This is something everyone here can do. All you have to do is install cookie cutter. You can do pip install cookie cutter. You can do conda install cookie cutter. You can do uh, brew install cookie cutter. They have Debian packages for it. Um, pretty much every operating system has it. Uh, it is not just our flash in the pan show you at PyCon Singapore. Uh, this is something that's used by um, big companies everywhere. So when we are at PyCon and there's Microsoft and Yelp and LinkedIn and a bunch of these other companies, um, they're all using cookie cutter internally. Uh, so, and every IDE major one, like PyCharm, PyCharm starting in August, they're going to work on cookie cutter integration. So this isn't just us urging you to do this. This is the whole world urging you to release packages, be creative. Now I'll start up the... Yeah. And you'll notice that we, we skip over the boilerplate, uh, but you might be wondering what's in an actual package, and, and that's something that we encourage you to, to look into as well, that you know, once, once you get the hang of creating a package, or you know, before you get the hang of it, if you want to just play around, open up setup.py, look, look at it, what's in it, look, look at the documentation. The more you know, the better. Okay, one second. So here are a couple packages that started in this way. Super simple, small packages, just a teeny bit of code, and which have increased somewhat, or quite a bit, binary not, or cache property. Yeah, these, these are packages that we, that we created using exactly this, this process that we showed you just now. And they're, they're packages that, that are widely used now. And eventually, the simple projects can go into, grow into complex projects. 
So here's a bunch of them that kind of started this way. Well, these didn't start with cookie cutter, but you know, similarly, the you know, you have you have projects that that seem huge, gigantic efforts, Django, Matplotlib, IPython, cookie cutter, and and um, the the thing is, though, that a complex project even starts from a simple project. It has to start fr from somewhere, from that first line of code. So yeah, complex projects, you know, they grow from that seed. And um, Cookie Cutter itself is now a complex project that has evolved to have a team of core developers, but it started as as just this um, this thing that I made with with a couple files, just trying to get something to work locally. And I remember when I created it, I didn't even I didn't even think it was worth releasing it as a package at first. I was embarrassed. I thought, oh, maybe this is just a little utility script that that I might use tomorrow. I might, you know, I shouldn't really release that. But but you know, I released it and and I never imagined that it would turn into the size of a project where I don't even know every line of code. No one on the core team knows every single line. Um, but that's that's the way projects evolve. So what what project should you build? Uh, you know, we, we talked about our projects, but let's talk about what what we encourage you to do. And there's a simple formula for for creating a project, and that's to build what you need. That if you are when you're programming, typically you run into some some interesting problem where you, you wish you had a tool that solved something. You you wish you had a library that did something and you might you might look around on the Python package index or on GitHub. You might look for that tool and and um, there might not be that tool yet or there might be some versions of that tool that you try that don't quite work the way you want. And these are great opportunities to to create a Python package to to build exactly what what you need for your purposes. And then sometimes the community follows. Sometimes you're not in it for just yourself. Sometimes other people join. They they submit issues and pull requests, feature requests, uh, or they they become your advocates. But that's not always true. Sometimes you release a package and nobody uses it except you and and it it doesn't matter if you release a package that you find useful for your projects that that means that you can you can easily reuse it you can easily pip install it you can add it to your requirements file of of your next project and be able to reuse it without having to code it up again from scratch or without having to copy paste the other thing is that, you know, in the beginning we mentioned your profile on GitHub. It's something else that, I mean, that this is what, you know, people look for. So, really, focus on your needs. Focus on what you want to solve with the package. Don't try to anticipate what we want or what, you know, another attendee or another person wants. Focus on what you need because once you start using something and other people start, or once you create something and other people start using it, if it's not something you need, it's going to be hard to maintain. But, so, yeah, focus on you. Now let's, let's go into the story about Cached Property, a package that we mentioned earlier, and this is a package that Danny created that he maintains now. And it's a four-class package. It's it's quite small. It has, I think, 130 lines of code. Uh, it caches object properties, which can be really useful if you're getting data from other sources or you're running a complex operation and you want to cache it in as a property. This handles it for you. This is the code. Oh, I was wrong. It's 131 lines of code. Um, this is the code for the original class. Uh, the first instance of this appeared in the Bottle web framework, but every major, every not every major, every web framework uses this technique. And all I did 
was because I was taking this code from non-web projects and copy pasting it from project to project. And that's, it got annoying to do, it's accident prone. So I was like, oh, I'll just use cookie cutter and I'll package it up and put on the Python package index. And I thought I would be the only one to use it. And um, yeah, as you can see, this, it, it had a very humble beginning. So nine lines of code, just a simple class with an init function, which you probably all have written before, and then, and then you know, a, a get method. And this, this is just such, such short, such simple code that you know, I'm sure everyone here has written Python code that's more complex than this. But this is as simple as a package can start. But then it, it got noticed. Uh, first of all, someone pointed out that, hey, this isn't thread safe. So they submitted uh, a pull request with some corrections. And then we had to figure out how to test it, which was pretty challenging. And then it got noticed by members of the core Python team. And there is a debate as to whether or not to port it or rewrite it or do something like that and get it into the standard library. So me, it's pretty awesome that me, Daniel Wright Greenfeld, might be affecting the direction of Python. Um, it's kind of awesome. And this, yeah, this wouldn't have happened if he hadn't thought to take, you know, to copy paste that code that everyone copy pastes into a library of its own. And it, a, a lot of things use this little package. For example, uh, the uh, the Docker Compose tool for Docker, it has it as one of its requirements. And that's, that's kind of awesome that, again, this little thing I did has, you know, it's still pretty humble, but it's in not so humble places. Yeah, and this is the type of thing that can end up happening with your packages. Now that said, you know, <laughs> we have to counsel you not to be ambitious. It's not always going to work out that way. Most of the time it doesn't. But... Um, we want you to. Okay. Yeah, the the trick is to identify these these little problems, these little snippets that you keep copy pasting between all your projects. Find find these these places where you can you can improve your your coding productivity by just packaging something. And address it, package it, and and move on. Uh, it, one of the nice things about this, for example, with cache property, I didn't know that it wasn't thread safe. And yet someone else pointed it out to me, and then I learned that, hey, this, this code isn't thread safe. Uh, so that's the thing. What you think is trivial and that you've solved under another condition that you might not be aware of or you haven't thought of, uh, all of a sudden now there's another problem. So by sharing this code, you're improving your own tool set. Yeah, and you and you just you learn so much. You you learn from every contribution. So we're gonna give you some quick stories about a bunch of packages which have gone through this process. So Django Uniform is another library that that Danny created, and these days it has it now lives it now has a new life as a as a, a new library called Django Crispy Forms, which is, which is maintained by a team of contributors. And it started uh, at the beginning of 2009 when I was at NASA. And um, uh, we, we, had, we were building a Django project. And it was my first professional one. I dabbled with Django until then. And the problem is that Django out of the box is not Sure. It, Django out of the box is not Section 508 compliant. And that's a US government regulation for a lot of software and tools that everything has to be Section 508 compliant. And you're probably wondering, what is Section 508? Well, uh, an example of Section 508 compliance is, is having a website be accessible to colorblind users of that website. So you can't have, um, say, green and red mean, mean different things on the website so that it's indistinguishable to, to um, colorblind users. 
And for those of you who are building websites, 7% of your audience are colorblind and have this particular um, uh, issue with being able to read things. So this is not, you know, this is actually a, a huge deal. There's, you know, millions of people with this um, condition. And then there's also people who can't see, who are, who are blind, who are listening to a screen reader reciting your site. And for them, uh, back in the day, when every layout was done with tables, this was a problem. The screen readers had issues uh, with tables, and so the mandate at NASA to meet Section 5 way compliance was then set of tables for layout, which was really awesome back in the day. We had to use that crazy div thing. So, so the challenge that Danny faced at NASA was that the project he was working on had 80 different forms, and they were all forms that were using tables, and converting those forms so that they used div elements was, was this monumental task. You couldn't just manually change every single form, and, and you know that would take too long to make sure it works. So I wrote this snippet of code um, for those of you who know Python, which is everybody in the room. Um, this is broken, um, which is why the link to it is really small, so you don't go and investigate my broken code. <laughs> um, but this was it. This was uh, this got bundled into a package. So Danny packaged it. Oh, and one thing to note about it is um, is that it's it's just one function. It's it's so simple. It like we mentioned that a package can be as simple as a single function. And yeah, so we packaged it and uh, later on it, it grew from there and uh, it, it grew substantially in, in usage. Um, very quickly it became in use at every NASA center, which was totally awesome. Uh, and um, as well as, uh, you know, major newspapers across the United States. I don't know about the world. Actually, I do know about the world. Um, it was used in a lot of different places because it was a handy library. And because people started using it, they started submitting requests, feature requests. So I added um, generation of the entire form via Python. I know, yeah, you're supposed to keep your HTML separate from your Python, but this was just so easy and elegant to use. Then, of course, you're generating forms, so you have to control the, the form buttons. Uh, and then once you get that going, people want to have, be able to control the, the layout, very fine-grained. And so you start adding widgets and controls, and this adds complexity more and more. And I stopped actually having to need a lot of the functionality in the project. So a lot of it, a lot of the features came from users of the package who submitted pull requests that, oh, wouldn't it be great if this, if Django Uniform did this or that? And the project just grew and grew. And eventually, um, Danny ended up leaving the project. But you know it. That was because the, the project kind of outgrew itself. The project, so Django Uniform originally was, was called that because there was a famous uh, HTML, CSS, JavaScript front end library called Uniform for styling forms. And, and then there was the rise of Bootstrap as, as an alternative, very popular library with alternate form styling and people wanted Django Uniform to support not just uniform forms but bootstrap forms and and so the the project evolved and uh, Miguel Araujo was one of the core developers of Django Uniform he ended up forking the project to create re or renaming it calling it Django Crispy Forms and um, and Danny deprecated Django Uniform so that it would handle both Uniform and Bootstrap. And a few days ago we checked, it was up to nearly 2,400 stars. So this, out of that one broken snippet of code that we showed you that please don't go and investigate, <laughs> it grew into you know a package used around the world by a lot of people. And now both Danny and Miguel Araujo have moved on from it, and but there are a team of of 
developers that volunteer to maintain Django Crispy forms. So that's that's just you know you never know when a package will evolve to that point. So that's the story of Django Crispy forms. It's it's moved on. It's grown. So now we're going to cover Django packages. Django Packages is online at DjangoPackages.com. It, it is a website for comparing different Django packages. And we created it at this, uh, this online hackathon called Django Dash in 2010, where, where teams of two or three people would compete to build something open source using Django. And here's an example, uh, or I guess you can't see it fully, but there's the there's a comparison grid of of different packages. And if you scroll down the page um, on the website, you can see different features side by side compared. And this is one of the core pieces of the online Django ecosystem. This is how you find which package to use. Uh, and it again, it grew out of this contest, Django Dash. And our first idea for it, because we were kind of cooking up ideas, was, hey, um, how about an automatic birthday greetings for Facebook? Because no one's going to do that. It's such a novel idea. Yeah, we, we had no idea what we were going to build. <laughs> so we, we thought about that birthday thing. But then we were just we're too lazy to learn the Facebook API. And, and so that was, that was why we ended up creating Django packages. It was, it was just completely on a whim that we, that we, uh, yeah, that we, um, that because we were too lazy to build this other thing, we thought, oh, maybe this will be easier. And in fact, when we started it, the plan was, hey, on the Django wiki, which used to be a thing, uh, there's these comparison grids for blog engines and CMSs. And we, we said, hey, let's duplicate it, and, but do it in a database rather than in Markdown. Yeah, so we, we, we took this screenshot from, from the Django wiki, which was a comparison of different Django uh, CMS apps available, and we used that screenshot as, as our mock-up, and we just implemented a site based on that that one table. And we had some stretch goals, like you know, making it possible for anyone to add a package, uh, fetching data from GitHub and the Python package index, and making grids something that users would construct. So that way we could have community participation and we wouldn't be the ones uh, maintaining the data. That, that was kind of our goal. And it, it worked out. It it's turned out pretty nice. So here's some thoughts that we've had about it. Uh, it was built, the, the core bit of it was built over a weekend. So, um, you know, at its heart, it's, it's pretty simple. It's grown to be complex. But again, simple, that's the place to start. Yeah, and, and it was a need that we were overwhelmed with all of the choices of, of different Django libraries out there, and we wanted to be able to compare them. So, so that was how this came up. And yeah, so again, just focus on, on your needs when you're creating an open source project. So that's the story of Django packages. Um, next, we're going to cover requests. Uh, everyone here uses a request, right? Raise your hand. Okay, yeah, and then pretty popular package. Yeah, didn't Kenneth, we didn't write it. Kenneth Kenneth Ken, Wrights wrote it. Yeah, Kenneth Wrights wrote this one. Didn't he keynote here? Yeah. So, all of you are very familiar with this. And his problem was that Eurolib and Eurolib two are and were hard to use. So what he did is once he identified that hey this hurts, and he looked at the options and he said oh these hurt too. Um, this is why he he created the idea, and in winter 2011, he, he started coding, and people started using it. And uh, look at him now. I don't need to recite his story any more than this, but it started with that one small bit of, hey, I've got this pain point. I want to fix it. And the interesting thing about the request package is that, is that Kenneth has just taken uh, libraries that already 
exist and come up with and he's he's come up with better APIs for them and that is that's an example of another thing you can do when you're creating your own Python libraries. You can look at what what libraries out there are a pain to use. What could you what could you design a better API for? Or look at even at, look at the Python standard library and think what what standard library modules could have a nicer API? Like I know subprocess could have a nicer API, for example. And and people have tried to make subprocess have an elegant wrapper around it. Kenneth has, for example. No one has gotten it like just right. So that's something, you know, if you, you want a fun challenge, that's something to do is try to come up with an, an interface for it that's easier to use and and actually make it work. All right, now we're going to talk a bit more about cookie cutter. Yeah, so when I created cookie cutter, um, before I created it, I I was I was on this little streak, you know, I, I was maintaining a GitHub streak of committing something open source every day and and I I just I thought, "Oh, well, well why don't I just create as many new packages as I can just for fun, just just to see what would happen." And um and as I as I was doing this, I got I got tired of copy pasting the package boilerplate, and um, by boilerplate, you know, the every package I was creating had a Travis YML config file. It had contributing instructions. Um, it had you know readme a setup.py, um, some starter tests. I got I got tired of of just repeating from package to package to package. And at the time, I had just created a static site generator called complexity and and I thought you know creating um, creating a Python package boilerplate I could use the same techniques what if I used similar concepts to create a project template renderer and and that was how cookie cutter was born and soon after the first release the pull request began that this was the, the at the time there were other there were some other libraries out there to to create project boilerplate that there was uh, paster and then in the JavaScript world there was yeoman um, but you know I tried I tried all of them and I just I just felt like they were they were not quite what I wanted and and um, that was how it was born and I um, so yes, this is a screenshot I took um, because she was um, trending on GitHub for a month because of this. So she's the head of Mozilla, um, and yeah, that's my wife. I'm I'm very lucky. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and um, yeah, then and then Danny blogged about it, and it was a little embarrassing. <laughs> but um, yeah, he needed an image for the blog post, and that was when I you know, took five minutes and just really quickly created a cookie cutter logo and, and um, you know, that was really the only reason we have a logo. I don't have logos for other, other projects. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, it's, as, as we said, it grew from the small need that she had into something with thousands of stars, uh, hundreds of pull requests have come in and uh, we, we there's a booth for it at PyCon North America this year so we, we were just there in Portland uh, it's yeah it's it, yeah. it just grew and grew it's kind of awesome and this is um, we mentioned cookie cutter Pi package um, if you go if you check my github you can you can look at the cookie cutter pie package template itself and you can see what the boilerplate code that you would get if you generated a Python package would be. And the thing is you don't just have to use this particular template. There's alternative uh, Python installation packages that are out there and they're listed on the cookie cutter readme. There's also ones for Django projects, Flask projects. Project Jupyter, everyone who here is using Project Jupyter or IPython, that kind of tool chain, they're actually creating some to work with this. So it's, it's, yeah, a lot of people are using this. We don't want to be stuck in the boilerplate. And here's cache property, and as you can see, it's it's got some of the same repeated files. 
and he created it with cookie cutter too. And the end result is that now anyone or everyone in this room can create and submit packages very quickly. And uh, that means that, you know, if you go to the Python package index and then you follow into the source code, you can see markers that this was created with cookie cutter, be it the contributing document or now we stick in badges. Uh, so, yeah, so, we, we're trying to get more people to do more creative stuff. Yeah, and there's, you know, we really would like to reduce the number of excuses that people have for, for not creating Python packages because it's just so easy now. And, you know, if anyone here has a hard time and, and wants help with releasing their first library, come find us. Or if you released a library and you want, you want to help get it out to the world, let people know, uh, let us know and we'll, we'll help you promote it. The other thing is that, let's say you Sorry. are doing microservices. Uh, you're, you have a company with microservices, and um, one of the problems that will, happens when you're dealing with microservices is what if, I mean, I mean, it's important to have the same conventions across each service for discovery, for documentation, for interoperability. That's one of the places where cookie cutter really, really excels. That's why um, a lot of companies use it internally. So it's, it, it empowers you at a lot of different levels. I do want to bring up something. Some of you might be wondering, oh, are there, are there too many Python packages on the Python package index? That it, it can be annoying. Some of you are probably laughing. I know Graham's laughing. <laughs> um, that you know, it, it can be a pain that, oh, you can't find what you need. And, um, and you know, the, the people who complain about this, sorry, Graham, are, are beginners and grumpy coders are the two <laughs> main groups of people who complain about this. And, and the thing is that, um, you know, if you can't find what you need, you need to, you need to learn how to search intelligently. So, you know, try, like if, if Python package index search doesn't work, you know, search GitHub, search Google. Um, that argument is similar to people who complain that, grr, there's, there's too many websites out there. I miss the old World Wide Web before Google was created. Um, or you also have people who don't read Python books or blogs or articles who are just in their little corner not um, exploring what other people are doing and they're reinventing the wheel. We're, you know, yeah, there, there are times that we say, hey, there's something out there that doesn't quite do what you want, so create your own. That's different than being ignorant of what's out there and just creating stuff because you haven't even bothered to look. Yeah, so you can read the, the blogs and the books and to figure out what the interesting packages are. There's uh, Planet Python. If you search for that, that's an aggregator of of all the Python blog posts out there. And you can even, if you have a Python blog, you can get yours featured on there, for example. So the more you read, the more, you know, the more interesting libraries you can discover. Um, the other thing that people have is that they don't go to meetups or they don't come to PyCon Singapore. So uh, those people, you know, they're missing out on the chance to, to discover new things. Yeah, so you're, you're doing the right thing by, by being here today, this weekend, by, by expanding your knowledge and finding out about all the cutting edge tools out there. So just always remember that the more packages exist, the better we all off are. But more packages means a diversity of selection. It, it means that you have different viewpoints on the same problem. Yeah, it's kind of like, certainly I can cook chicken and put sauces in it, and there's a way that we do it in Southern California. But if I come here and if I go out to eat with you and you take me a place where there's chicken and sauces, it may be based off the same ingredients, but I can tell you that the food here tastes really different. It also tastes really good, but um, you get the picture. 
And the, the diversity of different Python packages out there is evident when you, when you look at the huge variety of Python web frameworks that, that are out there. So like we, we love Django, as a lot of you may know, but if Django doesn't meet your needs, you can, you can easily find and use another web framework. And um, just case in point, the, so the bold items here, Flask, Pyramid, and Web2Py, were written as alternatives to Django. So if, if um, you know, imagine if someone had had told Armin Ronisher of Flasks, like, hey, stop, stop writing a new web framework. There's already so many web frameworks out there. We don't need another one. Flask would not exist. And you know, these, if if Flask and Pyramid Web you know, all, if they didn't exist, then then all of you. Uh, Flask pyramid developers, you you'd all be forced to to learn Django and and you know I don't know we we would enjoy maybe <laughs> but, <laughs> but you might not yeah, enjoy it so much. So so um, choices are great. Another example is the Python shell. Fernando Perez uh, he he started uh, IPython as a experiment, a side experiment, and uh, it grew from there to, you know, over 150,000 lines of code and its launch project Jupyter, which who here is doing data science and using IPython notebook? Raise your hand. Thank you. So there's a good number of you. So yeah. that started as this little side experiment. Um, and the, the interesting, an interesting thing about IPython is that was, that was Fernando Perez's first Python program that he created that little, you know, the 259 line of code program because he he tried out the Python shell. It it wasn't quite what he what he needed, what he wanted, and he he thought, oh, I'll just do a little experiment to see if I can create something better. And uh, these little experiments are are just so valuable, especially if you're coming in with a fresh perspective and and I and you have a, a mind to be able to see what what could be better, then then some of these experiments can turn into the next big thing. So your contribution is is important. It it adds it adds to the aggregate whole, and it means that the you know we are greater as a group because you have added your intelligence, your your smarts. So, and the thing is, it's better. More is good. It's better to write a new library, even if no one uses it. Even if you use the library that that your little thing was supposed to replace, because it it will teach you how that original library was written. And um, it, it's better to write a new library than to be limited. If if there are options out there that just don't meet your needs, that that you know, if you go out there and try these different libraries, and you just and you, what you find out there just isn't quite what you want. Um, you know, don't be afraid to write new libraries, and you know, use use cookie cutter. So we're going to now give you the story of Matt Plotlib, uh, and we're getting close to the end. I know it's 10 a.m., but uh, so we started late. So. We started late. Um, so who here uses Matt Plotlib or is familiar with it? Okay, um, so the story behind it is, is better than the tool. It's, it's incredible. So there was John Hunter who passed away a few years ago, and Matt Potlib was his, was his concept, his idea, and it, it benefits us as, as a species. Yeah, so um, Fernando Perez of IPython and Jupyter told us this story. He was a very close friend and collaborator with John Hunter. Um, Matplotlib was created by him in by John in 2002 to solve this this problem uh, that he was John was working in a lab. Uh, he was a postdoc at the University of Chicago Hospital, and he was working on the analysis of epilepsy seizure data in children. And some of the children, they, they don't respond well to the, the epilepsy medicine. And so to fix that, or to help them, they require brain surgery. And so to do this, they would take them off of what medications that they're on, open up the brain, 
and try to trigger a seizure and use electrodes that have been attached to the child to determine what part of the brain needed, was needed to be removed. So this is, this is a major investigatory and also fixing surgery. So you need to have all your pieces in place to make this work. But there is a problem. The analysis tool was a proprietary product and it required an expensive, like crazy expensive license to work. And the license was enforced by a dongle that you had to plug into uh, a laptop or whatever computer was running this or the software wouldn't run. So this company uh, was saying, hey, um, we're gonna prevent you from better operating on children in need because we want to make our money. <laughs> yeah, and so, um, and and he also, uh, you know, MATLAB was also too expensive for the lab, and so, and so they switched to Python. And so, what he did is he wrote this tool to localize where the look the electrodes are located on the child, um, and then they would collate that with. Um, you know, an MRI reconstructed skull. So they would map this out. And then uh, you can see on the left, um, there, there's a predecessor to MATLAB. Matplotlib. Matplotlib, sorry. Um, and it would plot and analyze the seizure data. And so together with the electrodes in place, next slide. Yeah, it would, it would trace back a 3D location in the brain of where the seizure was focused and so, John, this is an awesome story. He, with this, he was attempting to, to heal people. And he originally, John Hunter, offered this plotting code to Fernando Perez to include into IPython. And he, his offering was as, as a patch to IPython as this, this contribution to the existing library. And Fernando loved it. And, but the problem was Fernando was, was a grad student. He was working on finishing his grad thesis. And as anyone who maintains a library knows, it, it can be a lot of work to, to review a, a very big pull request. And, and so Fernando encouraged John to, to create a separate library to, to package up his code. And what John did was he, he created a library called Matplotlib. So those are some stories about open source projects uh, that have grown from small pieces of code that were addressing problems into awesome tools that we're using today. Yeah, so you, you really never know what what the future of a of a little snippet of code that you reuse what you never know what the future is is going to be um, that said we've we've mentioned a lot about writing new libraries there are situations when yes you absolutely should consider contributing your changes to ex existing projects out there existing python libraries and um, you know especially if if they are minor fixes or enhancements that if if it doesn't make sense to create it as a separate library it's it's always nice to contribute it back to the existing library and if it if it fits the project needs and goals then certainly but you know it's time to start a new project if no other project does what you need. Like it just doesn't quite fit or there's simply nothing out there. Or you've tried the options. I mean, yeah, you've tried the options and, and you're just not happy with, with how things are going. And if, it, if you feel that having your own library means less resistance to getting in the code that you need and uh, it gives you more freedom to add the features that you want, then do it, create that package. So, good to summarize, anybody can create and release a package on the Python package index. And we've shown you the, the tools to do it, or there's other ways to do it. You can look those up online. And hopefully there, 
there should be nothing stopping you. All you have to do is just do it. And we would love to see a variety, a huge variety of of Python packages out there coming from the Python Singapore community that that um, there are just so many smart, creative programmers here and and I think I think it would be wonderful to you know to for me to be able to start using more of your your software. Yeah, I mean we you know, we, we can say, yeah, we know certain tools really well, like Django. We know that extremely well. But one of the awesome things about this room is I can point out someone and ask, what do you know that I don't? What are you, what are you a subject matter expert on? Or what do you have a lot of familiarity in that I don't? And, and you, I could use that skill. I could use that knowledge. So everyone here has something to add. Yeah, and, and our hope is that maybe... Maybe in a few years, someone in this room right now will be will will meet you in at PyCon US because you'll be giving a talk about about your future library or maybe even keynoting PyCon US because because your library is just so important and fundamental and I I think that would be amazing. So. My name is Daniel Roy Greenfeld. Yep. And Audrey Roy Greenfeld again. And we love open source. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah sure. Yeah. And some questions for Daniel and Audrey. Any questions? First of all, I would like to thank you guys for this uh, inspiring presentation. Uh, I have two questions actually. First one is, right, uh, every time I create a project, I will have some kind of internal fears that Oh, I'm not using the best practice, or my code might have some issues, or uh, my code are not clean enough. Will anybody uh, scroll me on this? Well, this is kind of an internal issue that prevents me from really promoting my uh, project. And uh, how can I overcome these issues, and how can I teach them to overcome these issues? And uh, second question is, if I really want to contribute on some of the open source projects, where do I start? Because sometimes, the project might be too big to understand in uh, a short period of time. Thank you very much. Do you, you want to answer one or yeah. answer? Okay. Uh, you can stay there. Um. <laughs> So with the first question, which is uh, you know, the fear of releasing, I, I, I get that. I completely understand. Every time I release something new uh, or a new feature release for a project, I feel fear. Uh, you're not alone. Uh, and there are times when I get pull requests that are correcting my mistakes. Uh, I know that there's at least one person here who's done that. Um, there might be, who here has contributed, yeah, there's, yeah, so they fixed my, the, my problems. Um, and, but that's okay, because I learned from them. And um, now I know a better way to do it. Or even if I didn't accept the pull request, um, or, you know, I, I learned. So the trick is, it's, um, do, do you do like rock climbing or anything like that, which you have fear that you overcome the fear? Um, that is... You know, you just have to think it's the same thing, and, and I can do this. I have some things to add. Yeah, I, I have some things to add uh, that you, um, first of all, if, if, um, if you're putting your first or your early code out there, um, one of the things that can be reassuring is that probably nobody will, will even care. Nobody will <laughs> notice. Um, and, and if you're worried about that, you can even use a fake name. Um, like I know I have, I have my Audrey R GitHub account. I have, I have a couple fake GitHub accounts where I put code where I don't, you know, if I'm embarrassed and, and I want to just try experimenting with something, you can do that. Um, oh, the other thing is there are tools out there that will check your code quality. So um, 
you you can uh, I'm, I'm blanking on I don't, there's landscape.io there's other similar code quality checkers so you can run those and and um, really improve your code before before other people see it the second question. oh what's the second question the second question was contributing to existing oh how do you contribute to existing projects was the second question yes. do you want to answer um, Yes, yeah, so, um, so with contributing to existing projects, um, typically the way that, that we end up contributing is, is if, if we're, let's say we're working on some Django site and, and we run into, you know, we use a lot of different third-party Django libraries for our projects and, and often while, while using someone's library, you'll find, you'll find a bug or you'll wish there was a feature and um, filing an issue is, is the easiest way to start on an existing tool that you already use. But then the next step is if you, uh, you know, you can offer the, you know, when you find a bug, you can, you can offer to submit a, a patch, submit a pull request fixing that bug. Or um, if you, you know, if you don't know what to fix, you can also look for projects that have low-hanging fruit issues. So issues that are marked, that are tagged on GitHub with the label low-hanging fruit. Those are, those are beginner-friendly issues that are, that are open for new contributors to start on. And there are some problems that, sorry, there are some projects where it is very hard to contribute to. Um, so for example, Django itself is, um, you know, I'm going to be polite because this is being recorded, so uh, it is very challenging to contribute to that. And it's, it's not the only one. So sometimes it's good if you have a favorite thing that you want to contribute, but it's a hard path to do it, find a different project. Uh, but the one thing that all good projects have is a contributing document at the same level as the README. So if there's a project and you can't find a contributing document, find another project. Any other questions? Oh. Last one. Uh, thank you very much, guys, for your speech. It's very inspiring. Um, you already uh, speak a little bit about, you already uh, explain a little about, but if you can give me um, a little deeper into, like um, uh, write your own library rather than contribute to something that is not quite similar or what you need but, but suddenly you find that if you need some things or you do something like uh, you could make this library that fits on, on your needs. Do you want to answer? Uh, sure. Well, so, so there's there's really a it's there's a gray area between when you should contribute to an existing library and when you should create a new library and it really it really depends on how similar that library is to what you want it to be and um, and it, it can be it can be tricky it can really be you know on a case by case basis that if you you know with with if you're looking if you think that a if you think that what your idea can be merged into an existing library, then then the first step would be to to um, you know talk to the developer of the library or the team and and propose something and see what just get some feedback, see what they think of your idea, and um, and you know if if they want to collaborate, then then why not? It, it can be really fun to to um, to implement a feature for an existing library, um, the time that you you might want to create your own library is is if let's say the libraries are very very different from from what you from your idea for how it should be. So if if let's say you, you would have to completely change the API of of some other library in order to have it be the way you wanted, um, you know, or if you would basically be spiking a project, in other words, sending them a huge pull request that changed every single file just to get, just to get um, your, it to work the way you want. That's an example of when you might want to just create something new. So another thing that you can do is uh, 
let's say, for example, there's a library that doesn't quite do what you want, but the underlying machinery is awesome, what you can do is you can start your own library that extends the existing library to give you the API or the controls that you want. Uh, request, Kenneth writes his request didn't start that way, but that's how it is now. It wraps, what is it, URLib3, and, uh, and that's what, what powers it. So it's um, one of the nice things about this approach about wrapping an existing library is you can do that as a prototype and maybe it always worked that way. So you get the benefit of all those other people working on it. Or you might say, hey, there, there's a different way of doing it. And this way you're not being, you're being nicer about it. Yeah. To, to add to that, often what, uh, what people do is they will, they will create a standalone library and then, and then they will ask the existing maintainer, hey, I've created this experiment, would you like it to be merged upstream? Would you like to, um, you know, or if it's, if it's changing even CPython's standard library, would you, you know, you can ask if you can submit a proposal to, to merge it upstream. And um, that's, that's a very nice way to work. Okay. Yeah, the, uh, thank you. Thank you. That's all we had. Uh, okay. If you have any questions, you can ask them. Outside. Yeah, don't, don't hesitate to come and find us during breakfast or in the hallway. We, we'd love to meet as many people here as possible that this is this is an opportunity for us to talk and learn new things. Thank you very much. Okay, some admin matters. Uh, the Wi-Fi is SSID.